developer. Right. You know, the, this period, yeah. right? Starting with the, 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 that, the figurative right. stuff. That's right, 70s, 80s, 90s, right? Yeah. And, and not at all, yeah. there's no reference, yeah. looking at the earliest works in the show, there was no reference to the... Yeah, well, well Ga I mean, Galen's been at it a while. I mean, he was making paintings in the, in the uh, late 30s and 40s. And um, yeah, I think he probably didn't make any work he'd consider mature until the late 40s. But they, they were all abstract. He was a, he was a quite accomplished abstract expressionist, kind of Hans Hoffmanish, you know, color field paintings of a variety. I think that was kind of common at that in the in the 40s and 50s as an academic style, you know. Um. <laughs> this is a recent, recent thing, 94. I think. So he's a really, he was a really accomplished colorist, and that's one of the things I, I, I uh, learned from Galen was how to, how to put color together, how the edges of things work, all abstract, formal stuff. And that's the, you know, the paintings, if you spend some time with them, you'll realize that that's how they kind of break down into these kind of elemental terms. All right, so I think that is it. In the initial interview, you, you, you said you'd, you'd you considered yourself artistically formed before coming to Chicago. And I think, in terms of, it was, it was really a revelation for me to lift up the hood. You know, this idea of you saying, well, actually, you know, artistically, these are my influences from out in that region, and that's where I'm from. You know, to, to, you know, to actually go back and look at him and say, oh, yeah, Toby, how could I have missed Toby? You know, and we'll return to Toby when we get to the temper stuff, but before that more important, I think, what it, what it explained to me in terms of your own stylistic development was, again, the relationship between abstraction and figuration. Like, with all of the, with the Northwest Coast Mystics, none of them had this, the ability to go, you know, from one to another. Like, it wasn't such an ideological divide. So I see you as having um, uh, inherited that from them, but when you came when you came to Chicago, it's interesting that the, the earliest stuff, you know, even going into the dark show, was so pointedly narrative. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own oscillations, even within that kind of swampy morass between the two. Um, well, it, it, it's interesting that um, uh, that that that's the work, the the, the that strongly figurative stuff. Uh, that I uh, that I first had success with because I was trying to do abstract painting at that time as well. I had done some uh, some abstract works when I was in uh, grad school, um, and I think uh, for me it was a kind of crisis of content that led me to make things more figurative and to go sort of public with that work okay. over the abstract stuff that I was doing at the time because I really didn't. I didn't, um, at the time I was really concerned about what things meant and that I found that I couldn't really make meaning or at least of the kind that I was interested in uh, with, the, with the kind of, with the, at least with the abstract, you know, playbook that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I look back on some of the works I did in that period and they, they're fine. I mean, they, they, they hang with the work I do today, but that's right. because today I, I have a different view of, yeah. I'm not as hyper you know, focused on some of the things that obsessed right. that I was obsessed with earlier on. So I transformed anything, any of those tendencies into narrative tendencies by way of just trying to make a point with with uh, paintings, narrative point of some sort. Yeah, and I, I it, it was one of the earliest pieces in the show, Evening of My Dysfunction. If you could talk a little bit about the process, because it's completely uh, 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 other than I think to the results, mm -hmm. but I think in light of what you're saying about covering up any kind of abstract tendencies in favor of going for more explicit mm -hmm. narrative meaning, you know that the story of how that painting came to be is quite revealing. Yeah. Well, I it, at some point before I did that painting, I come to the conclusion that uh, well, what happened was it was a sort of an accidental thing. It was a little more organic than that, but um, I started trying to make abstract paintings a few years before that one. And they would always um, end up evolving into totally narrative, figurative things. Now, sometimes 
the, uh, the image uh, that would result, the narrative, would have no trace of that sort of abstract origin. It would just be simply buried under the layers of paint. Uh, working in oils, you can do this, you just, you know, it's opaque, you just bury it. Um, but I, uh, starting with that painting, and perhaps a few around that time, I started um, allowing that sort of abstract, this abstract impulse, which is all I can kind of call it, because that's where it came from, um, to sort of uh, hang around and suggest a form, and the form becomes transformed into some kind of narrative element within a larger context. So that, that's how that particular painting evolved. I, I had, uh, in this case, it was acrylic paint. Um, I had the canvas. I, I had no idea what I was going to do. I started a kind of, uh, you know, surrealist uh, automatic writing sort of thing, although that, that makes it sound fancy. It's really just <laughs> smearing <laughs> stuff around on the canvas until it looks like something and then going from there, you know. Uh, and. Uh, so I, in that particular painting is, is kind of interesting because I, I did that. I turned it into the figure that you see in the painting, uh, but there was, no, there was no background. It was kind of pink. It was uh, kind of an oil ground, uh, pink sort of thing. And I liked the form a lot. The form sort of said everything for me. I thought it was finished, or at least I thought it could be. I didn't want to wreck it because that's the other problem I have. If, you know, if I, I, I don't know when to finish them. Sometimes I wreck them. Sometimes they never get there. You know, it's just... This is my work, this is my life. Um, so anyway, uh, in this one I was sort of think, thinking of leaving, let, letting well enough be alone. And, uh, and during that time, uh, JSG Boggs, I'm sure some of you know the guy, he does the money, the drawings of money and stuff. I didn't know who he was. He hadn't started doing the money stuff yet. Um, he called me up. I didn't know who he was. I told I t he wanted to meet me. I said no. Um, I don't know. The stranger called me up on the phone. I, I, you know, so anyway, but he told me to bring some booze over, so I said, okay, you know, come on. <laughs> That's what it was like back then. Uh, so, so Boggs came over, we had a few drinks. I, I, he, he, uh, he was an interesting guy. He was living in London at the time. He had a kind of a, he's from Florida, but he had a kind of British accent. I guess you get that if you live in London longer. <coughs> or it was just Boggs, I don't know. But anyway, uh, he, he talked me out of a out of that painting and uh, and a drawing. He said there were some collectors in London he knew that would love to have these things. And at the time, I don't think I was attached, and uh, so uh, so he took them. And uh, then he called me up on the phone uh, after after you know I don't know a month or something. He said, you know, I, I sold that drawing. I've got a check for you, but you know this painting, I don't think it's done. And I remember telling him that I didn't I wasn't sure it was done when he took it. And I said, well, you know, bring it back, you know? And so, <laughs> so he did. He brought the painting back, and, and I'd been thinking about it, uh, and uh, I knew what to do. So I got the painting back, and I put that background in it, the, the cityscape, the scene, which uh, sort of also completes the narrative, because <laughs> the painting really wasn't the thing that it is. It didn't have the title or anything um, until that background went in. And, uh, and uh, you know, despite the, 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 the nifty story behind that, um, uh, a lot of my paintings occur that way. You know, they'll, they'll have one part and then they'll acquire another part. And sometimes it takes time. They just need to gestate. You know, it's, it's what it is. They just need to sit there and wait for me to change my mind or be in a different, be in a different place before I, or maybe, you know, just wait for inspiration to strike. I mean, it's, it's a real thing, actually. Some, sometimes it's required. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't always there, that's for sure. You have to avail yourself to the muse. Well, I mean, you can work around it. You can just do <laughs> stuff anyway, which is what I do. But occasionally it's required for <laughs> certain things. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that transition from 89 to 90. Because I think that that's a, that's a uh, again, the palette changes scale changes, you know, what was going on, you know, in that period? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny, but I mean, it's just dumb technical stuff that caused this, this shift, which, which, is, which is a more fundamental shift than just dumb technical stuff, but um, it's the way those things facilitate.